I'll pick on somebody. No, wait, no need, no need. So let's ladies first. Let's go with the lady on the left hand side. Hi, I'm just wondering uh, the notifications for your clash detection. Notifications, yeah. Yeah, is that email? Is it in the platform itself, or like when you can assign different things to different people? Yeah. So How there's, do they receive that? There's a number of options, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Ian actually to maybe answer that one. I can, but Ian, you, you you say it far better than I do. Yeah, sorry. I couldn't quite hear what was the question. Notifications, yeah, how in, can in they be delivered? Loop. Is it email, PDF, Excel? What? It, it can actually be multiple ways. So so you can, you, on the project, when you, when there is an issue, that's actually been a change when Reese made that update to Peter's issue. A, you can have a set up every 24 hours. You can be emailed on that project with a list of all the changes and a, a link directly into Revisu of where that issue is. It also highlights what, what it is. That's one way. You can change those settings to be instant or every hour, or every two hours of, as well, and it could be per project. But there's also then a dashboards and reports that do get output, and they can be automated as well. So they can be done every day, a, once a week, once a month, and so on as well. And they're really great forms of a sharing. But there's no, no better way than grabbing those reports, screenshotting the dashboard, and highlighting who's the worst offender, and emailing out to the group with your project manager and saying, hey, we need this addressed. That's the best form in reality. But there's great automated ways of doing it too. Yeah, yeah. So th there's a variety of options. So, I mean, depends really w what it is you want. We, we try to give our users flexibility. But you are getting the notifications in real time in Revisto. So one thing I tend to do is switch off all of my um, email notifications and get one a day, which is effectively a report. And within the report, there's hyperlinks to the issue. So you can click on the issue on a PDF report or an, e uh, an email, and that'll open up the app on your uh, tablet or d uh, laptop if, if that's where you have it installed. So yes is a short answer. So <laughs> any other questions? Yep. Maybe you could introduce yourself as well and. Hi, my name's Jim. I'm with Technostruct LLC. Hey, Jim. I've got a question for Brian. I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm interested on your thoughts regarding the role of the VDC provider standing between the design team and the construction team? So I think, I mean, ideally that person's on one or the other. Um, you know, they are integrated into the team, but I think it goes back to that uh, uh, responsible and accountable, or accountable and responsible role uh, to have them engage directly with the team throughout the entire project. Um, that's. I think that's really where the success is, and I think we heard that in, in the other two presentations as well, to you know, have somebody who's there holistically through the project who knows what the end goal deliverables are and make sure that they can shepherd that process, lead, you know, question, analyze, <laughs> you know, debate when those things aren't there. Um, but I don't know that we always have the luxury of doing that. Uh, I think that's changing. But oftentimes, again, it becomes a, a plug and play. We need somebody to do this, and they get plugged in for a task and maybe pulled out and then go do that task on another project. Um, I think that was, that's what, one of the things that was interesting in your presentation, looking at those, those metrics all the way across um, and, and, and having that person be there just as important as the project architect, the project engineer, the construction manager, because they really need to be part of that team. Uh, otherwise, they're, they're really just a firefighter for issues as they come up, and that's not the best way to accomplish the goals. Great, thanks, Brian. Great question. And then just, uh, I think, a, a couple of common themes we heard a number of times as people process technology, and I think everyone touched on that. I just had a question for Colin, I think, was you know, taking everything you've learned into account, how do we ensure that you know, the next generation of our industry, how do we nurture them into um, you know, having all of these good skills from what the teams have learned yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's there's different takes on that. I think there's a, there's a number of different ways. Um, you have, in, if I look at my own progression, I, I left school after A-levels, and I did a part-time degree, and went through the motions, and I've progressed that way through developing technical skill and then kind of adding in the, the managerial aspect. That's one way of doing it. Um, personally, I'm very, very keen on developing that from a very, very personal perspective. But there is, you know, we, we, I don't think personally we do enough. There are some very good courses with some of the universities in the UK. Uh, I know Belfast, Queens have, have now got a, um, a very, very well-respected course uh, surrounding BIM. But I think that, you know, we, we probably don't make coming into this industry in this area as accessible as what we, what we should do. And for me, there's actually a, there's a blended 
there's a blended methodology here somewhere around um, sort of different highways or different swim lanes maybe. So you, you may start off looking at being a design manager, but actually the, the skills are transferable and you know, we need to have better transition, better, better oversight really and transparency over who can do what, what skills are transferable from design management into planning, into BIM, into project management. And actually if we do that, we'll find that more, the more people, I, you know, everybody who starts working in a BIM environment wants to know more. They want to know more about the technology, they want to know more, more about the people and the process. And I think that we just need to nurture that a little bit more. I, I, I don't think I know the answer, but there's, there's lots of different ways and maybe that's something that we just should all work together towards and produce a, an even better evolutionary um, I'm approach. All for that. I love Levisium with a, a local college, literally a stone throw from where I, I live earlier in the week. And it was clear that you know, there's a disconnect between academia and industry. And I, I, I sat down with actually the chap I met used to uh, work in the school I was at and was expecting me to, to be singing on stage, which I, I do um, every so often, or try, but there's the, a the sort of change in, in career and, and that sort of focusing now on digital construction and the, you know, the, the courses they were delivering were nowhere near the sort of level that they potentially could be with the help of industry experts like yourself. So I really think there's a real opportunity for, for more engagement, and I'm not sure of the answer. I think just, just to embellish that a little bit, actually, the, um, I was talking to one of our recruiters and one of our talent people a, co a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about what age do we need to start and engage with people to get them in, interested in construction generally. Uh, and I was actually shocked to hear that the, 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 the perfect age is six, which is absolutely incredible. Like I've, got, I've got a seven-year-old, and when I started talking to him about what daddy does, he just sort of like, yeah, okay, is, can Thor break that, you know? And it's really interesting that you need, we need to try and think about that sort of mentality and that sort of engagement. Absolutely. Any, um, any questions from the floor? I can keep going, just check there's nothing uh, online. So I think we, we looked at the, the clash detection process in a couple of the sessions. So I just really want to understand, you know, typical challenges with traditional workflows. And maybe, Peter, I can throw that one to yourself. Can you talk to us about some of the traditional challenges with clash detection workflows? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I come from uh, construction and uh, design myself. So I have used to run these workflows. Uh, one of the biggest issues is that you're doing it in a, in a silo. Um, you're doing it on your own. It's very difficult to disseminate that information quickly to the people that have to actually act on it. Um, there are ways in which you can use other clash detection tools and then perhaps manage a spreadsheet or something like that. But that's not that requires effort. You know, it, it, it's prone to human error. Uh, so, yeah, that that's the big thing for me with with Revisto's clash detection is autom automating those processes and actually saving everybody that's involved in those things a massive amount of time without getting too salesy about it that's one of the ways we can actually justify you know that any any investment because the the time saved massively outweighs any well, yeah, maybe that's one i know both ian and colin have gone through that process but i mean what what sort of time savings ian have you seen from moving to a new platform to address those challenges is there yeah, about four times oh wow yeah so we, we did a, we did a, a work and one of the folks on my team really dived deep into it to understand our existing workflow versus the new workflow we have today and it's about four times uh, savings just just for us but the like I mentioned earlier around that one button solution for some of our clash tests just simplifies that approach uh, and then being able to say to the schedule so if you think you're four times saving on what we do you're linked into the schedule on the project delivery program your team then actually executing that design for that work package is far more streamlined as well. So it's, yeah, it's a, a quite an extraordinary shift for us um, yep. in how we execute design. Absolutely, and then I think coming to you, Brian, the, you know, coming back to the people process technology, uh, we've heard lots of amazing stories, but I know in, in, on the cold face, it, there are challenges along the way, and I just really want to understand what, you know, what, what are the barriers you've seen in your work between the sort of people and the technology? What, what's, holding, what's holding them back? I think the biggest thing that that I saw on the the people and process side when I was in practice was uh, multiple of the same elements. You know, going back to the beginning process, who the architect wants to place the light fixture, 
the electrical engineer owns the light fixture, the electrical engineer specifies the light fixture, but the architect still says, well, I need to make sure that it's, you know, dead center in the grid. And that, you know, that those duplicate efforts, that coordination and overlap cause issues, and that has a ripple effect, right? That's the same with, diff you know, diffusers. Um, that's the same with toilet fixtures, right? The, the plumbing engineer owns that from specifying it, but the architect's responsible for the ADA clearances and the code requirements around it and, you know, setting those expectations of how do we collaborate about that and define who's ultimately responsible for it is, is a big issue also. Fantastic. Was that a hand? Yep, let's take one from the audience. Don't be shy, guys and girls. We, we love your questions. Hi, um, Nula here. Is, uh, I'm from RKD Architects. So the question I have is um, the categorization of clashes. So theoretically, when I'm looking at clashes between design um, and construction phase, so we want the, con the contractor to inherit the design models and start building the construction model. So before that process happens, we would categorize any remaining clashes from, um, say, design issues, design clashes, which we would look to the design team to resolve, okay. or clash resolvable, which mm -hmm. would be a very easy clash for the contractor to um, fix in his model. Yep. And then your false positives, which we'll just, you know, ca can negate. Can you um, automate those categorizations? Because obviously when we r run those clash tests, it's a visual thing. You have to run around the model and mm -hmm. um, categorize them yourself. Can you set parameters to automate that? Great question. Well, I'll maybe push that one to Ian. Did you get that? Or oh, Peter, who wants to take it? Yeah, so the, the, the easiest way to, I guess, prioritize which clashes you want to focus on would be just to use the clearance uh, function. There's no clever way at the moment to uh, try to see which clash is a real clash and which one isn't. That does still require somebody to actually run through those, those, those things. Uh, but again, with, with the grouping, mechanism you can reduce that effort massively by deciding what grouping strategies you want to use for for that particular workflow um, the other thing with with the issues once clashes are created you can very easily change the assignee or batch uh, change the assignee from you can basically multi-edit issues at the same time is what I'm trying to say uh, so if, 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 if the responsibility needs to go to the contractor or whatever, then, then you can easily move that across. Yeah, just thinking while Peter was talking, I was thinking of a way that would work. So that, it's not the workflow we would do. So we would have that review process of reviewing and approving clashes that are not considered they're trivial, that can be a, not a, an issue for construction. So we do that process. But alternatively, what you could do is you can push all your clashes into the issue tracker and using that, uh, the, the status where it has, it can say a major or a, a blocker clash or a trivial clash, you can then cat categorize those clashes that way, the ones how you want to do it. It's a little bit, little bit more manual than what um, you would like, but you can categorize them that way, and then the teams can filter by exactly what clashes are trivial that could be solved in construction or blockers that need to be solved right now. So you could, yeah. I think, yeah. I think one thing just to one, one thing that you could do to, to look outside of that a little bit is um, start to think about machine learning and AI because actually you can and I'm sure Revisto have probably got this on their pipeline of development at some point um, but you know if you can teach something to identify something which is trivial so you know you, all you do is it's just point say don't don't look at this again it's it's not and then it just assimilates the same principles the same criteria and it rules it out. Um, we're seeing a little bit of that. Um, we've certainly not gotten into any detail, but we're, we're starting to think about you know, what, what might AI need to know in order to answer the questions to break that down because we come across that a lot. You know, the, you've got a mass number of, of, of issues and how do you disseminate that into what's truly important. We use work packages because it affects our procurement, but actually other people have got different drivers. Fantastic. So um, I think we've had a fantastic 
range of presentations. The panel discussion is awesome as well, I think. So as a maybe a closing question from me and some of the people online is, what, what do you all see as the next trend, the next thing coming in the pipeline for, for construction? Is, is there anything that you foresee that nobody's really talking about yet? So maybe Brian, I'll, you're closer, so we'll start with you. Man, I got to go first. I was trying to was trying to come up with something there. I mean, I, I think the I, I think the big push that that we're seeing, and in my my small part of the world, and I kind of go back to what Colin talked about in that range of education. How do you diversify the conversation so it's not just uh, a technology conversation and something that falls into that isolation? You know, like you talked about the. You know the up. You know I am. You mentioned I think about up mentoring. I was. You know that was kind of the the conversation that that was resonating in my mind in that discussion where you have, you know, younger college graduates uh, that are coming out with these highly technical backgrounds, but maybe don't have the expertise on constructability, means and methods, and sequencing and trades. But you have these more senior individuals who may not be that. And how do you blend those those expertise? And that's. I, I think that's a big thing as as we talk about you know the people and process side of it to to really focus on how we get everybody well rounded and diversified in their knowledge of both the design and construction side and the tools that can help facilitate that. Yeah, I, mean, I I absolutely agree with that. I think that the the people bit now is the the thing that we need to focus on as much as anything else. I think that we you know we have the technology, we have the processes, we have the governance. All we need now is just the, the, the people to put in the right places to address the, the areas that we need to, to probably develop. You know, the, the one thing I, I still can't wait to see is, is that day when we have all ecosystems which are just fully conversant with one another. You know, Jacob's done and Ian have done a great job with the, the one button approach. I'd love that it'd be a one, you know, a big red button, you know, the smack the big red button and all of a sudden there's an ecosystem of everything and it's all very interactive and you can get to where you want to be. You know, whether that's compliance or whether that's understanding competency or whatever it, whatever it needs to be, I'd love that, that, that magic pill just to exist. I like that story. So, <laughs> and any other comments, Chops? Yeah, I think, uh, like, we can talk about all the different technology components and, you know, that's what we were talking about today. But, yeah, there's so many other things we can talk about around technology and what's coming. But, like, agile careers is something that, that we haven't, like, that's right on the team of what Colin and Brian are talking about. Agile careers and how you get people to transfer their skills into where they need to be in this sort of industry as well. We've, we've got a person that's come from accounting background that's now supporting in design, that's working with Jonathan Sutton and our digital, digital solutions team to support totally different background, relearning how we operate in design and in, in, in construction, but his skills that he's got in a totally different environment is game changer for what we're doing. It's a totally outside approach. So agile careers is something that's actually grown in Jacobs and I'm sure a lot of your organizations are doing the same. Tremendous. Peter, maybe a final point? Yeah, just one final one from me. Um, and it's less about technology, more just an observation on, on the trend uh, of, of something which interests me. Uh, I've seen the increase of mega projects, you know, these very, very large projects around the world. You've got HS2, uh, you've got the, the Red Sea projects, you've got massive, massive projects in the Middle East sprouting up all over the place. You're going to have the next tallest tower in the world. And what you need as these projects get more common are uh, solutions that can actually handle all of that data in, in, in one place, ideally. Um, so yeah, that's encouraging for me that we can actually handle that, that, that size of um, project. Perfect, thank you, Peter. Well, really enjoyed this first session. So maybe you can join me online and uh, in the room here to give all of our speakers a round of applause. Thank you all for your contribution. Fantastic. <laughs>